And welcome to the Wild Hearts at Work podcast. This is your host, Melissa Boggs. And this week, we're going to talk about the future of work, particularly remote work. And for that, who better for me to have on the podcast as my guest than Cliff Pollen? Cliff, please introduce yourself to our listeners. Thank you so much, Melissa. I couldn't, I've been so excited to be able to spend time together on this. Um, Melissa, we met when I did sort of the first, you know, uh, you know, remote workplace that was commercialized for agile teams. We and, did. you know, so that was incredibly fun. And with the pandemic, um, there's a lot of, um, I think, significant opportunity. And that's an area that we've been very focused on, which is how do we embrace this opportunity of not really remote work, but hybrid work? And how do we take advantage that that really could be the approach that will bring us so many good things? So a little bit of the history is just that journey. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's been a number of years that we've known each other, at least been crossing paths in the in the remote and hybrid world, if you will. Um, do you want to go ahead and just quickly tell our listeners, just because otherwise it'll be the elephant in the room, um, about what you're doing right now and why they might be interested in what you have to say about remote work? I think for a couple of things. So I can talk about what we're doing now and a little bit of the journey here. Um, I've always been fortunate over a fairly long career now of new technologies and how they change the way people work. And I've always embraced those concepts, including the work early on that, that there could be a better way for all of us to work together in a hybrid fashion before anybody even used the word hybrid. And so today what we've been focused on is two aspects of that. How do we actually recreate the, the, the fun and the energy that we feel when we're all physically together. Um, and the other piece of that is that another core problem is unfortunately, most meetings stink. And <laughs> if we think no. about, <laughs> <laughs> and I always get a laugh when I say that and people actually then reflect on a little bit. And I think you've been doing a lot of work in that area around culture and engagement. And the work that we're doing has been to try and dive deep into how can we take the methods that make for great meetings that are only used by a few people today, those experts who have learned them, and translate them into something that everybody can use today. And to give a little bit of numbers there, there's 50 million meetings a day in the United States. Oh my goodness. I'm, <laughs> I'm shocked that you even know that number, but that is not actually that surprising, actually. <laughs> and then there are, if I asked you the question, um, I went to the International Association of Facilitators, which is one of the leading organizations for sort of, you know, facilitators. How many facilitators would you think are um, members um, of that organization that are based in the United States. So we'll do a comparison of US to US. Oh, okay. So 50 million meetings, Yeah. but I'm going to guess that only a fraction of them are actually facilitated. And of that fraction, you know, how many are actually part of an association? I'm going to say 30,000. 86. People? People. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, you know, just to, to try and bring it together, um, I think those facilitators did wonderful jobs of facilitating, um, you know, those wonderful offsite meetings that we all went to. And I think the opportunity is that we're all facilitators. We actually run meetings. We're trying to create environments where everybody has a voice, where people are engaged. And that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how do you take those methods and make those methods accessible for anybody to use either for what we call a snack 
a short meeting you're doing or for a whole meal, you're trying to ideate something new or there's a significant challenge or problem that you're facing. And so we want to bring those methods to the masses, basically. And you're taking those methods. You mentioned a virtual office earlier. So um, for those who are not familiar uh, with Cliff, um, your product is Wheelo, correct? Did I jump the gun a little bit? No, you weren't ready it, to go there yet? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, so our so just to, to set the stage there, but um, we've done two things. We think um, what Wheelo is, is first of all, an engaging virtual space, but don't think of 3D, don't think of, you know, sort of, um, you know, virtual reality. A simple view that's highly engaging, that's easy for you to, maneuver around, but to feel together. So that sense of safe, but easy and relaxing that you're together with your colleagues. And then the second piece is to build in these methods so that if somebody wants to follow those, those methods, some that, that have been well-practiced that work. So whether it's liberating structures, whether it's Lego serious play, whether it's open spaces, these methodologies are well tested and well practiced and reflect moving from command and control to everything that we think about of let let's give ownership to the people closest to the work let's let them make the decisions but give them a framework to go a little bit faster in getting to those good outcomes and that's what wheelo is about those two pieces i love it so much so i want to paint a picture for the listeners um and I imagine by now some of you are already Googling, which is great. Um, but if you can imagine having been at an open space and specifically having been at an opening of the space, um, you could picture this in Wheelow. Like you could look from above and see a circle of chairs or actually layers of circles of chairs. And you have you know, your little avatar has your picture on it and you're sitting in one of those chairs and you're sort of looking from above. And so, like you said, Cliff, it creates this feeling of actually being there when, you know, I know many of us have been trying to recreate, you know, open space in Miro. Right. And while you can create the marketplace and you can create, you know, zoom breakout rooms, doesn't quite meet that feeling of being there or like sitting next to your friend. Like you can literally sit next to your friend in the circle of chairs in Wheelow. And let's, and I think why this is so important. Um, thank you for the much better visual description that I was doing of our, our visual product. Um, the, the thing that I'm excited about is there's, I think, an opportunity where the office was centric. It was the place we all went to. And even in the Agile Manifesto, it sort of said you have to be physically together and you have to have high bandwidth conversations. And I truly, I've loved it. I've lived through, I managed used projects earlier in my career that were waterfall that tremendously failed. Um, so was a big advocate when I learned about, you know, just the agile practices and it saves so many things that I was then involved in. But I think the other thing it does is it opens up for individuals, the opportunity for both a much more balanced life because we don't have to commute into a space. It creates diversity and equity because talent from all over can be there. And I, I do think that in my career, um, and I've been CEO of a public company um, that was global, that I saw both women lose out on so many opportunities because of the trade-offs that they were making. And when they had kids, as much as you were trying to figure this out, it always seemed like they had to be super people. I just don't want to single out, quote, women as the issue around diversity and equity, but that was a big piece that I saw in, in my career. So some of what I think, and, and, and Melissa, so much of what you talk about, I think there's an opportunity here from a climate perspective to basically create and embrace that we can do this, not exclusively, 
But the concept that even we might reduce commuting by 30 or 40 percent by people working close to their home or in their home as well as the office, but having these very engaging methods, because I just want to share, I think one of the things that's happened is what Zoom and Teams have done is proliferate more bad meetings. They are wonderful products. They have let us get through the pandemic, but they haven't necessarily addressed the core problem. And I want to be clear, I, we, we will sit on top of those products. We want to ride those products, but I think we need to change that. So I think there's a lot caught up in here that leadership has to sort of do a mindset change on that, that this is a very important part of our future and not something you're just trying to manage through. Absolutely. And I think to reframe what you said, yeah. I mean, Zoom and Teams and all of these things have been useful as a stopgap. Right. But I think we're all starting to recognize, and this has come up in many episodes, probably every episode of this podcast, <laughs> um, is what we've been saying all along. You know, the pandemic has just accelerated this idea that people need space yeah. and not just physical space, but like space in their lives. And that work is not the end all and be all. But if you create a really engaging place to work, then it is a very important part of that person's life. And when you can create, you know, again, meetings, like you said, that are not, you know, a drag um, through some of these methods, then you're, you're not just increasing engagement, you're increasing the experience of those people in the meeting. I think so. And that's what I've learned is I remember being in those wonderful meetings that were facilitated and you said, why did that work so well? And it was a bit like the magician. And then when you understand the magician is using some methods that are well practiced, that you can embrace, um, but they just haven't been created an environment that makes them easy to embrace. That really, I think, is foundational to building engagement, and not even building, but culture within the organization by letting the people closest to the work make the decisions, own the, if you will, the problem or the aspiration. Um, and I think that's going to be fun. Absolutely. And I think, I think it is a lot easier for leaders to trust in that type of decision making when they can see that there's some structure around it. Right. It's a lot harder for me as a leader to say, OK, yeah, team, you can make the decisions. But all I see is they're kind of like piled into a room, you know, looking to the sky, so to speak, um, when you can create some structure around it that I, I as the leader can trust in that's proven, like you said, then I'm I'm a lot more inclined. It's a lot easier for me to let go of that control. I, I think so. I think so, and I hope so, because that control piece, and especially when you add hybrid, because there's, as we know, a sense by people, if I can see you in, a, in the office, then I have more control. So I think the methods, um, and if you take something like liberating structures, where there is the set of guardrails sort of built in, where you're sort of transferring ownership, in my mind, with a sense of, Here's some things for you to think about. So if we were doing something around hybrid work, you might say, we can only go to countries where we already have a presence. I can't have you land in a country where we don't know how to pay taxes, we're not licensed to do business there. And you could say, so as you develop the strategy, here's a guardrail. Um, and if that's built into the process, to your point, I'm using a very specific example, um, I think that's just more comfortable for leadership. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We've talked about hybrid a lot. So let's yeah. let's actually dig further into hybrid. Like when you say that, what do you think? Like what's coming to mind for you when you hear hybrid? I clearly think that you have to embrace the concept that people are going to be in any physical space, but meeting together but they're not in the same physical space. And for me, I think the starting point has to be if one person is virtual, not in the same physical as everybody else, 
then the whole meeting, and people have said this, is a hybrid meeting. And you don't want second class citizens. So in my mind, there's a couple of things you want to take advantage of. You may have a physical office for people to go to and should. People may work from their home or they may work from a colo space that's only five minutes from their house. And so they're going to be in those different spaces. And the second piece is then to embrace that concept and build around it and don't make it office first, you know, make it we are hybrid and we are we are virtual in where we are, but we have to build everything in that supports that model as opposed to, I think, a hybrid model of, well, there's everybody in a space and everybody else is remote. I think the remote word has to get dropped. And that that's not unique in, you know, I don't wanna, many people have talked about this. Yeah. So what do you say to the people who um, assert that hybrid just doesn't work and you have to all be together or all be remote? Um, I think that these work patterns have been there forever. What I mean by that is um, it was very rare if you got into a even medium-sized company that you and your team and your stakeholders that you interacted with were within the same space, the same floor. Um, you could be on a campus together, but they were five buildings away. So you often didn't do it. So I think what I say is, um, you know, that all of that design was when we didn't have phones or mail or any of these things. And the only way you could communicate was to come together. Um, I, and so I think it's time to just break that. This is the difference. I don't know. Yeah. So I, I think we have to start. Um, with this whole new model and approach and not try and drag several thousand years of history into trying to design the new way that we're going to work um, as well. Uh, yeah. So that's, I, I think it's, I think we're carrying too much baggage. Mm, I love that phrase. Yeah. Um, I have to confess that at one time I was one of those people who really felt like, you know, I'm totally on board with remote work or I'm on board with, you know, co-located work, but it's impossible, you know, to really make it work well as a hybrid. And, you know, I think the pandemic has made it impossible for you to believe otherwise because we made it work for 18 months and we're still making it work right now. Um, I do have to share a fun story is like yeah. one of the, to your point about it's actually been this way for a really long time. When I first used a virtual office for the first time um, was at a company where we were absolutely co-located, but we had a policy that you could work from home one to two days a week, but they wanted it to be staggered. So you had developers that would say, okay, well, I'm going to work from home Monday, Thursday, someone else was Tuesday, Friday, or just Wednesdays but they wanted it to be kind of staggered to have quote unquote coverage in the office, which meant that we were hybrid five days a week because there was always someone at home. Yeah. And what was so cool about this virtual office was it eliminated the need to create a conference call. Yeah. You know, I could pop into someone's quote unquote office with their little door yeah. and ask them a quick question and pop right back out again. And that was 20, 14, 2015. Right. And so, I mean, to your point, this has actually been going on forever, even if we didn't want to call it that or didn't even realize what it was. Um, so, right. I mean, talk about baggage. <laughs> and Melissa, I think there's another design point there. And I love that you, um, you know, many companies are saying, well, we need everybody in the office on Tuesdays, you know, we're going to give Fridays you work from home and Wednesdays you uh, work from home and Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, you're in the office. And I think that doesn't reflect any reality of trying to really think about what works for each individual. 
those could be awful days for me personally where I might like to help my elderly parent that day or pick up my kid or I'm juggling something with my spouse or personally, if I'm single, there's something that I like to do in exercising on Wednesdays. And I think if we embrace that, that time is the one thing we can give people, those commute times back, that sense of normalcy in the morning and not sort of say, we're going to do it, but we're going to fake it because we think the only thing we can do is either be fully remote or, um, or physically together. Because the reality is somebody has to work from home that day because they have some obligation. And that's why I think we just need to embrace it. We need to embrace it because it can work, but you need to have the mindset to make it work. Right. I think that's, I mean, that's an excellent point is like the intention and structure necessary, right? So we were all thrust into this, um, you know, some people more prepared than others. Some, some companies were already doing some version, but everyone was thrust into it, you know, in March of, of 2020. Um, but now, as we said earlier, we're reaching a point where like, okay, this is actually going to be how we are from now on. What do we actually need to do <laughs> to make sure that that is sustainable. Um, is there anything we haven't already mentioned that you would add that companies need to think about in terms of creating intention and structure around hybrid? There is. Um, I think too much of what's happening, or not too much, but you often have companies that run an employee survey and then the executives get in a room and start to develop a policy. And then they go out and roll that policy out. And of course, what the survey says in general is 10% of the people want to work at home every day, 10% want to be in the office, and the middle are saying, we'd like flexibility and choice, right? Building that this is a journey, not a destination, you're not going to figure this out. Let your employees design what works for them, create some guardrails, but turn this over to your employees. Use something like liberating structures to engage them, hear their opinions, let them figure out the solutions. And then you're getting ownership with the people who have to do the work. So some high level policy pieces, but Tim Cook saying, this is the answer and surprised that he got pushback um, because they never engaged their employees and only did a survey. The other piece I find comical is that it's the most valuable company in the world that's built around mobile devices, but feels that you have to be in the office in order to collaborate. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'm going to play, yeah. I'm gonna play <laughs> Tim Cook's um, yeah not defense attorney yeah. in terms of legal, but his devil's yeah. advocate here. Um, what if I hand over that authority and they just completely take advantage of me? Then you have a very poor culture. So obviously that is not what I'm concerned about, right. But, right. but I hear that a lot. Like I hear, it's so funny to me that, that people with so much power in an organization when presented with, you know, the concept of some sort of self-organization, there really is a lot of fear that people are not going to do the right thing, yeah. that, that people are going to do the thing that's right for them individually, and that somehow that is mutually exclusive of what is right for the organization. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, just from my personal experience, that's not how people work. Like, people want to do the right thing. People want to serve the company. And if they don't, they leave. At least this generation does. <laughs> I think I agree so much that you have to put that trust with people. If you carry that attitude that we, you just described, that negative attitude, then you're going to get more of that in your company than less. And the more you place trust in people, the majority of people will exceed your expectations. And, you know, we have seen that so many times. So I, you know, um, you, you've got to not just, and you, and I was thinking of your recent blog post, Melissa, you, you just can't talk the talk. You know what I mean? You've got to walk it. 
And so if you are going to let people self-organize, take ownership, take responsibility, give them some guidelines, that's okay. Give them guardrails. But um, I, I would say to Tim, you know, um, <laughs> you know, the other thing I would say is you as an executive of one of the largest companies in the world have a completely different perspective than the pe than the 50,000 people or more in April that are doing work every day. And so for you to think you can figure out what works best uh, is hubris, you know, so. Sure. And I think it, it comes, you have to have the notion that happy employees make happy customers, because if you don't, then you don't even care that much. And I'm not throwing any shade at Tim that no, no. he doesn't care. But but if you believe that happy employees make happy customers, yeah. then you have to get a little bit closer to it. You know, you have to not just ask them in a survey and survey monkey, but actually like, you know, give them some opportunity to des like you said, design solutions. It's not even just give their opinion. Right. Um I'm going to go on a small rant for a second, but I've heard yeah. the phrase help employees feel heard over and over and over for the last couple of weeks. And every time I hear it, and I know I'm being like, you know, pedantic here. Every time I hear it, I think, are you making them feel heard? Or are they actually heard? <laughs> like there's a difference. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we can do what every single employee has expressed as their desire, but are you actually hearing them? Or are you just creating an illusion so that they feel heard? Right. That is my rant for today. <laughs> and I, I think it's a wonderful rant. And not to, I think the thing, if if I was Tim, and I have deepest respect for what they've accomplished, so I don't want to, I would have organized something with employees to, re to, to have a very open discussion where they came up with recommendations given your concerns. And you don't have to necessarily buy into that, but immediately I would have called all those people who called you out and say, we need to do a session together. We need to dive in and I, I need you to design what this should look like. And I may have concerns and I may not agree, but the first thing we gotta do is open the dialogue completely with you and me in a room together in a virtual room and go do this and you know and 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 here and not so anyway that's that's yeah. where i would have gone immediately sure and and just to add on to that i mean the number one barrier that i see in organizations to self-organization is this gap of trust between leadership and teams that is just further exacerbated in situations like that when you know, the leaders telling themselves, oh, they just don't understand what it is that I have to deal with. And the teams are saying to themselves, oh, you know, this leader just doesn't understand what we have to deal with, you know? And so to your point, like coming together and actually having the conversation, oh my goodness. And yes, it would take time and it would take effort and probably you need a facilitator. Yeah. But, you know, in doing so, you're creating sustainability in the organization. You know, you're going to reduce turnover. I mean, you're going to, the payback in the long run is going to be so much more than the time and effort it took you to just kind of figure these things out for a week or two. And the thing I've seen now, as I've learned about some of these methods, in liberating structures, he could do that in an hour and a half for two hours. And the, the, what that would create in value and in ownership and buy-in I think that the return would be unbelievable. So this isn't days worth of work or, you know, this is, this is what these methods were designed for. And I think we just need to embrace them. So that's what, yeah. So I want to pivot to that a little yeah. bit. So you've got Wheelo. Yeah. You've got these methods built in. I know you've got open space, mm -hmm. you've got liberating structures. Have you had an opportunity to witness some cool stories and you, you can name companies or you don't have yep. to of like what they're doing in there and like what it is, what doors it is opening when a leaders are willing to have those conversations and B they have a tool like yours that actually makes those conversations possible. Yeah. It's what's been exciting is um, many of the people we're dealing with are in the agile space 
and I'm thinking of one example, and I won't I won't name the I won't name the client, but um, he was what you would call a wonderful VP of engineering, in my view, wonderful, um, very in, you know in touch with his people, trying to give people ownership to problems, really good um, you know emotional intelligence at that at that level, um, and he was the his problem was. He joined the company, now about 400 people, growing pretty quick. There was some historical engineering work that was done. And he was bringing in some more seasoned people who had different expectations about how the system should work. The systems were a bit too complicated, but the people who were the more senior people who created them were very nervous about people messing up because it was complicated. So quite simply, um, when I called him and I said, you know, we've come across these methods. Some of them we've seen, some of them are new. He immediately said, um, we talked to him about liberating structures. And he said, I, I've been missing some capability to better have these types of discussions to break through. And he said, and I need to transfer ownership of this problem for me to them. Right now, I'm up. And so he grabbed onto it. He read the book. He was in, we did a facilitated session. We were, it was a little muddy. We thought we were going at about two feet and it was about five feet deep. <laughs> and so, but after that, then one of his leaders grabbed onto it and you started to use it and did a follow-up session. And now for that group, the ownership is with the people who do it. What was huge strife in a fairly short period of time has become sort of success with ownership. And they were losing senior engineers because they couldn't basically be productive. That's all starting to change. And, and it's just fun to see that in a short period of time. And now people are embracing the techniques. And yes, they were able to do that in our system and all of that, but it was seeing somebody who was very experienced who said, I just didn't have any capabilities like this that I could grab and use. That is so incredible. I I was going to use the word contagious, but that feels like a not a great word to use right now, <laughs> but, but it catches on. It catches fire. We'll, we'll yeah. say that. Um, what type of companies... Are there, are there a certain type or industry or size that you see that tend to be jumping into this with both feet or is it all across the board? I think it actually, we're still learning. Um, so um, what I'm amazed by is a lot in the agile space because I think everybody in agile is thinking about self-organization, ownership, getting the right people to do the work. So I think they were people who were more aware of some of these techniques. Um, so that's one, but I'll say this weekend, um, we are partnering with, um, a local digital agency and consulting firm that's running a clean energy initiative for their community with several hundred people organizing around whether it's mobile, solar, all these concepts, you know, partially drawing on open spaces, but other techniques that they're using, and they're going to run that entire thing virtually. And we've set that up with them in a week. And we want to take that and just give it to every local community that wants to organize. How do we help to have a, a much cleaner, you know, um, you know, climate going forward? And oh so, my goodness! Yeah. So we've got like community service, and you know, service mm -hmm. to you know solving the planet. I mean, that's that's just incredible. It goes beyond you know just helping companies make money. It does, and I and that's what's so fun about it. And these guys clearly do that for a living, but donated all of their energy, uh, quote energy to Pun this intended. initiative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I. I will say that's what's exciting me and my and our team is we can bring it to so many people. This is about how people work together. And if we can make that better, um, which I think is the core problem, uh, we have good people. We don't have the right processes in everybody's hands, processes they can 
figure out. So let's talk about your team for a second. Again, no need to name names or anything, yeah. but tell us a little bit about how your team works together. Um, you know, what do you have in place to make sure that you stay a strong culture and an awesome team? Um, so we obviously work in our space every day. We are spread <laughs> over nine time zones. Um, we are a small team of under 10 people um, and half of us are full-time and half of us are part-time. Um, so we have time zone issues that we're dealing um, with because Check. we're yeah, <laughs> over nine, uh, nine time zones. Um, and the fact that we, since the day we started, which was in the pandemic, we have never been together. We do have history together, so that does help. So many of us have worked together um, before. And I think we were very conscious of what schedules work for you. So there was a whole thing about personal inventory and, you know, do you, is, you know, does Slack work for you? Do you like email? Do you want me to text you? How are we going to communicate with each other? Um, and then we're trying to do both regular check-ins with each other and, you know, some, some really good, I think, things on that front. And then we are learning these methods. We did not have these methods, which is why they appeal to us. So we're scraping our knees in front of our clients. Sometimes we do things, you know, internally that works. I'm saying, well, that didn't work so well. Or wait a second, this meeting's really heading south. Let's stop. What should we do? So I think it's just we're enjoying it. And I think that's that's we, we try and keep it light that this is an important thing we're doing and it's fun. Um, and um, but being conscious where each of us is both in stresses, um, which we can help, you know, personally and professionally and taking care, you know, a lot of self care. That's really incredible because you're on like you have this perspective that a lot of companies don't have because you're watching other companies that are also sort of on this um, threshold of the future of work come in and try these things and you get to pick up on some of them and go, oh, hey, we should try that too. Um, so that's pretty incredible. And then just the care that you're taking for your own team. You know, basically what I heard you say is you have working agreements and you continually check in on those agreements and both one-on-one -on -one, but as a group. Um, and it just sounds like you as a leader are really intending to create an experience for your team that you're hoping is reflected in all of your clients as well. And so, you know, you're getting to kind of set an example while learning from other people's examples. I mean, it's pretty unique, the situation that you're in. I, 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 I feel that way. And I feel that way because the people I'm with carry that energy. So we really are a team. Um, we can tell when one of us is hurting and it, it's, there's radar about that. And, um, and I think that's critical for people is that aspect of knowing and, and, and being very mindful of that. So, it, and then our clients have been amazing, the stuff they share with us, the learnings, um, and their patience, cause you're all learning, you're all learning together. Sure. Um, so on this journey of both building the product meeting all of these new clients and then learning about these new methods. Are there any books that have particularly inspired you? Um, I definitely would pick up the Liberating Structures books and I would watch and listen to um, both Henry and Keith tell their story of how they got here because I find that story incredible. Um, and then I've had the pleasure of, um, of looking and reading some of Sean Blair's work who's done a lot in Lego serious play. And so I'm, I'm finding that as I learn what underlies that, um, that the connection for me, and the reason I would recommend those two was, I think we all wanted to do better as a team member, as a leader, you know, a servant leader. Um, but we didn't, I didn't have these tools and I've been at this, you know, for, for a while, as they say. <laughs> and so I've, I felt like enlightened. Many others have been enlightened earlier than me, but I would recommend those two, um, as very both practical and helpful to connect on making change. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, I'm not familiar with Sean Blair's work, so I'm going to have to check that out myself. Um, Are there any podcasts besides the one we're on right now um, that have been really inspiring to you as well? Are you even a podcast guy? It's okay. Yeah, I am. I am. Um, I love Miriam Hadney's work. um, And I think all of her work does lean in this direction about how are we going to work together? Um, And she has a wonderful array of guests that I think are pushing the limits. And, you know, part of it is um, never done before. So they are are places where we also, she experiments with things where people mess up, but we're trying. And um, so people get a stage separately to do that. And I think that audience then says, go there because they've made mistakes and you can learn from those mistakes. Wow, amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, all right. So before we start to wrap up, I have one more question for you that I managed to build into almost every one of these episodes. Um, I get people asking me a lot when I say wild hearts at work, what do I mean? And of course I have my own definition, but it's always fun to ask my guests. So when you hear wild hearts, what does that mean to you? I do. I have the, I have the Ford Mustang, first of all, in my head. Okay. So, because I see a horse, I see people running and I see people feeling free Mm -hmm. and doing their best work, but a little wild and pushing the limits. And I think if we're not pushing the limits, then we're not creating the most wonderful work environment. And I, I think we can do that. And we need wild hearts who break out of the line all the time, step over it a bit, but for the, for good reason um, to, to make places better. So that's, that's what I think about when I think of the, 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 you know, the name and what you're doing. Amazing. That's beautiful. I'm always inspired by what other people hear from it because, you know, I mean, I obviously know what I had in mind and it's all roughly the same, but everyone has this like beautiful metaphor or description. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, So as we wrap up, was there anything, anything you want to share with our listeners about what's going on with Wheelow or anything coming up for you that would be interesting? You know, the, the one thing I would say is because this concept is so new, many people may not know of these methods or ideas, you know, two things, come in, um, grab a space. Um, If you go to our homepage, they're free. You can grab it. You can experiment. Feel free to contact me. And I would love to walk you through these concepts. And I do that all day with people because for many people it's new. And if you have used some of them, um, we'd love to show you what we're doing. So, you know, uh, my email is cliff.pollen at wheelo.space, W-E-L-O. And, um, and, but reach out, um, but go grab one of these, but come, come and experience it and we'll help you experience it and give it a try. Totally. And I do want to just, again, kind of reiterate, there's kind of two different ways that people are using Wheelo. Yeah. One is as a place for these liberating structures and open spaces. And then there are some people who live in Wheelo as right. their office. Um, so I think that's really cool because that's that's something that's sort of grown as I understand it. Right. So office, as you said, and the other piece, and, and then all this work that we're doing on the methods. And by the way, when you're working in the office, if you want to use some liberating structures to make a meeting better, that's 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 great. So cool. Yeah, they all kind of come together. Yeah. Um, amazing. All right. Um, well, Cliff, thank you for your time and just for the work that you're putting out into the world. I mean, you know that I'm a huge fan, um, of the product, but also just of the mission and what you're trying to do in the world with the product. Um, so I appreciate you being here and being our guest today. Melissa, thank you. This was a a complete pleasure. And I honor the work that you've led us all through. You've raised the questions for us. So thank you.
Oh, so kind. Um, so for everyone listening, thank you again for joining us this week. Um, I just want to remind you to like, subscribe, share with your friends, share on social media, help spread the word of Wild Hearts at Work. And if you're interested in supporting the show, we now have a Patreon. Um, it's linked in the show notes. It's linked um, on your podcast platform. Um, but that's a way that you can support all the expenses that go into running the show. But most of all, just glad that you are spending your time with us here on the podcast. So until next time, dear hearts, stay wild.